So welcome everybody. Today our chat is on optimal nutrition and I'm always excited about our chats. Obviously I do a lot of um, optimal nutrition and I do a lot of coaching and I'm actually in the process of designing an online program as we speak. And I'm very excited about this talk today because we're going to specifically talk about um, how to kind of get some better foods in your diet for specifically cognitive health. And we're going to explain why as well. So Charles. Okay, so I'm going to launch straight in because we're so few people. Hello, everybody. If you want to, if you want to unmute yourselves, if you can unmute everyone, if we're there, this few, we might as well talk. Um, so what I'm going to look at today with Christina is to um, to basically look into uh, the brain and nutrition and from the research that I've done how uh, nutrition actually sort of happens and that is why certain things that you ingest actually sort of end up affecting how you feel, what you do and how you are. Um, so, as you know, I'm Charles Leon and uh, I was a designer, I sometimes still am, and got annoyed by some bloody project today, but that, I'll put that aside, um, and also speaking and doing. Um, Christina's going to sort of just give us a quick introduction to Yeah, her. so a lot of the times when I work with nutrition, and like I said, the topic of today is specifically going to be on cognitive health. But with so many diets and so many options out there, we're really going to break it down um, into how actually when food comes into the body, how it's processed by the body and the benefits as well. We're going to be talking about just a little bit about how food can be great for some people and not so great for others and how to decipher that. We're going to just touch on inflammation, but we're more going to talk about cognitive health. And then there's also going to be times where um, Charles is going to bring up some topics and some studies that, that are going to discuss some of the non-negotiable foods that none of us should really be eating or at least eating in, in, um, very, um, in moderation and some ideas on why, why we need to do that to make our body and our mind healthier. And so, yeah. No, you become what you eat. And you become what you, <laughs> you do definitely become what you eat. And at the end, um, and this is a lot about what I do, as I work with people on specific um, foods that are going to be great for them and foods that they want to incorporate in order to have, um, you know, increased cognitive ability and have more energy and be stronger. And at the end, we'll, we're going to discuss how, um, and also give you a food log that you can fill out. And we'll give you information about that at the end and kind of um, near the middle as well with some foods that we're going to cover. And we'll also include a little chart which has got um, some of the major sort of studied nutrients what they are, what their effects are, and where you can find them in terms of natural foods, at least. So my, my sort of starting premise, the starting straight out of the blocks, is that brain and body are, are one thing. They're not two separate things. You all know it, but you pretend that there's two different things going on. Well, that's not the case. Not at all. Because you know that if you drink alcohol or you drink coffee, you get an almost instant hit. Um, and that's because what you ingest affects your brain. Now, not everything does, because not everything can pass the blood-brain barrier, obviously, um, or not so obviously, perhaps. So um, you don't get a chocolate brain if you eat chocolate, but you do get some nutrients from it. So there's, there are specific nutrients that get ingested that actually um, do affect the cognitive process. And they do that obviously via the gut mostly. And it's all about how it, uh, the molecular systems work and how it all goes together. So it's sort of gut, metabolism, then it goes through and creates peptides like leptin, insulin. Uh, they, they are the ones that can cross the brain barrier. They are the ones that can then encourage this wonderful thing. And I wish I knew exactly what it was, but I don't. Called brain-derived neurotropic factor. Now, this is the thing that enables, um, it, it, it actually affects the hippocampus, the hypothalamus, the amygdala, when these are all things that are connected with learning and with memory, and particularly spatial memory as well. So um, this, this substance, um, brain-derived neurotropic factor, which I'm gonna call BDNF for short, um, 
is an enabler, basically. It's like uh, the oil that enables certain other sort of hormones, chemicals, neurotransmitters to leap across the synaptic gap. Now, what I've got to do then is explain roughly, and I'm sure most people here probably know, but I will, I'll put up a little slide. Um, so, of how it sort of works, um, this one, right. So uh, basically once um, everything's passed up to your brain, the way that thinking happens, if you can imagine, is that you've got two spark plugs, one or two, one spark plug and one receiving point. So anything that comes up is either enabled, that is um, it's excited or it's inhibited. Now, both of those things create some sort of reaction somehow and if only anybody knew how we would love to know how it creates thought uh, we don't know how it works nobody knows and nobody understands what consciousness is but there's a lot of theories out there so um, what a lot of the substances that you ingest will do is they will uh, either enable the in the exciting or the inhibiting of that sort of leap across the gap which is where all thought happens. The other thing that, <coughs> that happens with that is that the more enabled it is, either in uh, inhibition or in excitation, the more plasticity, which is the ability, the flexibility of your brain to find new pathways, new neural pathways, and to change. So, um, I'll get rid of that one. so basically, it's, um, our brains have sort of developed through evolutionary, through evolution. Um, and what has changed most in our brains is uh, in the last, actually I'm not sure how long, so I won't say, but in a long time, is, um, is the prefrontal cortex, which is the main sort of, um, I don't want to say calculating because I don't like the metaphor of computers for the brain. It, it's the main sort of networking, understanding, um, a lot to do with conscious cognitive uh, uh, elements, and that has changed that uh, evolution, evolutionists um, reckon that the reason that that's changed the most is mostly to do with cooking and food. Um, and the thing that has made the greatest difference in this, they believe, is, um, is basically omega-3. And omega-3 comes in lots of different forms. One is called DHA which I'll talk about in a moment. But the brain is basically constituted of lots of different things, but one of the main sort of um, uh, agents within it is this, um, this, this about 60% of it is this, this substance very much like um, uh, omega-3, which in this particular case is called docosa hexaionic uh, acid. So it's a particular type of omega-3. And what that does is it's absolutely crucial for sort of membrane integrity. So if you visualize the diagram again, I won't go back to the diagram quite yet, is that that is what enables your synapses to fire better. Not that they won't fire anyway, even if you eat McDonald's, you can still have a functioning brain, not as good functioning though, that's true. And in fact, um, in terms of sort of, I'm gonna just put up another slide. Um, so, right, a um, tiny bit small, but that should be okay. So this sort of, the slide, the, the, the image on the left demonstrates um, what uh, evolutionists believe is uh, how we, well, they don't believe how well, we have evolved this way, but it's mostly due to diet. And what has changed massively, and I'll come back to this again in a moment, is um, our consumption in the last 100 years of uh, trans fatty acids, uh, which is probably affecting our cognitive abilities and certainly is affecting our ability, the ability of our brain to actually develop a little bit further. Now, one of the problems to explain, so if you can sort of picture the sort of, what you ingest is sort of coming up and I'll show you how that works in a moment in a little bit more detail. So we do not uh, naturally synthesize um, this substance DHA, which I can't pronounce and won't pronounce too often. Um, but so we need to take in 
omega-3 or omega-3 um, um, acids in order to supplement our diet. Now, what that does, as I understand it, it encourages something called encephalization. And encephalization is a lovely word, is all about brain body mass and the, the way that the brain has transformed itself over um, millennia in order to become what we are now and our cognitive, our imaginative and our creative abilities. So the key to this though is DHA, is the consumption of DHA and the use of DHA. <coughs> what it does, as far as I can understand, what it does is it, it affects um, the whole, first, in the first instance it will affect the poison and the pleasure as well of what you eat, it will train you, teach you, um, what you want and what you eat and what you like and what you don't like. And a lot of sort of architectural, architectural evidence, archaeological, sorry, archaeological, I'm an architect, so there you go. Archaeological evidence shows that hominids sort of adapted to consuming fish and thus gained a lot of DHA before, uh, and, and but as a result of that, a lot of this encephalization has occurred. And it's the interplay between the brain and the environment that's the ongoing thing. So um, this, in the last hundred years, we're consuming far, far more um, fatty acids and what are called linoleic acids and trans fatty acids. And these have increased so dramatically that um, there is also a much higher incidence now of um, depression. And that was... The other slide that I wanted to just check, or the other half of that slide, which I'll just go back to. Uh, so what you can see on this is, this is a study that was done of um, depression. Now, I'm not sure, I mean, this is an academic study, and I'm not sure that I absolutely believe or agree with it, because Japan has got one of the highest incidents of suicide in the world. Not the highest, but one of the highest. And yet it seems that, according to this study, that um, fish consumption, which is very high in, or most fishes are high in omega-3, um, has led to a uh, less occurrence of depression in those countries. Um, the UK doesn't e exist in there, and that's because we fried Mars bars. But apart from that, so if you can imagine that, um, that we've learnt um, how to um, how to educate our cells by what, what we ingest, and this also goes through to um, to the whole consumption of fish, and also um, I think that um, the other part of this is living by the seashores has meant that there has been an increase in or there was an increase in the consumption of fish, which then may have engendered the development of the brain, which then developed the cognitive abilities. Uh, um, so it's obvious, I mean, pretty obvious, that uh, abnormal diets do, which create obviously things like diabetes, obesity, and metabolic syndrome, and all sorts of things, also lead to psychiatric disorders. And this is sort of quite well proven now. Um, so you would have thought, and I think, certainly not me that's just thinking this, that by, um, by working with diets that you can actually begin to, um, to regulate some of the um, mental disorders that come with um, bad ingestion of nutrients. Um, so I think I was just going to mention one yep. thing here about the, um, the, the diet of many people around the shorelines, around um, areas where fish is prevalent there's and some of you might know um the study and and the research about the blue zones and a lot of those diets the blue zones is specifically about different areas um in the world that have the most centurions have the most people that lived to a very you know to a hundred or older and a lot of those people not only have a fish rich diet but it's also more like a mediterranean diet um and, the, and it's really high in um some of the other things that we're going to talk about as well the flavonoids yeah. and and the antioxidants yeah, we'll so in a moment yeah so um right i'm going to show you another little diagram uh, 
and this is about how it sort of comes about. Right, so what we have here is you have um, something that engenders your desire for food, like um, your hypothalamus is actually giving you that signal, which is part of the reward system. So you're ingesting food, it goes into your gut, then it comes out as, uh, or it gets synthesized into um, things called IGF-1 insulin, ghrelin and GLP, which then sort of go up and can break through the blood brain barrier into the limbic system, which is, uh, if you can see, it's that sort of slightly purple area of the brain, um, which is the sort of the, um, what they, well, it's the sort of what we call the midbrains in terms of it's the, the, in evolutionary terms, it's not the most developed part, that is the cortex. And then that goes on to affect your emotion, which then feeds back in with sensory inputs to the hypothalamus. Uh, there are also sort of things like leptins that are produced, and this goes down to your body physiology, which then there's a, as with all of these things, there's an incredibly complex sort of cycle of um, learning, reward. We, we spoke about similar things with um, habit as well. There are all these sort of very complex cycles going on in the body and all of them seem to be somehow connected to homeostasis, to our um, desire to get things into some sort of balance. And I'm constantly amazed at the capability of the body and the brain to, to get things into um, some sort of very narrow band of a Goldilocks zone of where we can exist in terms of temperature, in terms of ingestion of food, and how we can sort of get rid of things that we don't need. It is quite amazing. Now, whilst we're still sort of talking about BDNF and we're talking about um, uh, omega-3 and homeostasis, there was a brilliant study done in um, Durham and also in Australia and also in Indonesia, they reproduced the study where they gave children, um, they, they had a control group, of course, uh, so it's properly done scientific study following children, I think for seven years, uh, with supplemented omega-3 to see whether it did have, I feel sorry for the kids who didn't get it, but that's life, hey, someone's got to win and someone's got to lose, I guess. Um, so they did this study, they gave children um, supplemented omega-3, and they did find that it made a significant difference all through their lives because they followed through um, with the studies for years afterwards. Uh, they did find that it made a huge difference, well not huge, it made a, uh, um, a statistically significant difference to how they uh, engaged with the whole of the world and their brain health and their physical health as well. So that was really interesting. But as I say, what, what's, um, what amazes me is there's so many things that can't cross the blood brain barrier. And yet there are some substances that engender other substances to then uh, engender still further substances. And the weird thing is, of course, that this is all how we think. At, at the end of the day, your body is doing the thinking in a sense. And once it's done the thinking, then you're sending that back down and you're saying, right, what I need is another Big Mac uh, but, or whatever it might be that you need. Um, so basically food, most people think food is just for energy. Well, it ain't <laughs> at all. Your body um, has so many different needs but above all, number one is not just your, um, your physical health, it's also your mental health. Or I wouldn't quite say health, I'd say your homeostasis. In terms of it needs to get itself into the right kind of balance. Now, I think, and part of what this talk is all about, is, is actually um, optimising that. And to be honest, it's pretty easy, really. Just eat good food and eat a balanced diet. I mean, we all know that. But the weird thing is that you can sometimes diet, and I th think you were explaining this, Christine, which I didn't fully understand. Sometimes you can diet, think you're doing very, very well, you lose weight, or, or you don't lose weight sometimes, even though you're dieting. And there may be many, many complex reasons, but, um, but basically it's not really about um, restricting types of food, although it can be restricting the amount of food you eat. We'll come to that a bit later in terms of sort of calorie restriction. 
which has also been shown to, to have very beneficial effects on synaptic, well, actually also the opposite. If you consume too much uh, trans fatty saturated foods, then uh, it will impair your cognitive uh, abilities and also um, will uh, potentially, although not quite proven, proven in rats, I think, but not in humans, it will shorten your life as well. So, um, so let's talk about some of the actual foods and some of the actual nutrients and see where we get to with those because there's a very nice list which I'll, I'll just show you briefly and then we'll sort of talk about it if that's okay. It's coming, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. Right, so um, I'm going to just show you this. We're going to uh, attach this to the um, to the replays, um, and you can all have it. And Christine is going to attach her um, her diet diaries or consumption or nutrient diaries on top of it. But um, so this basically is a quick sort of scan of those um, nutrients which have been most uh, reviewed scientifically rather than anecdotally because there's so much rubbish out there that we decided that we tried to stick to uh, what has actually been sort of scientifically tested, proven and shown. So I'll just get rid of that for a moment. So high trans fatty saturated foods, yum, sugar, delicious, Big Mac, lots of fat or lots of frying, um, definitely, definitely uh, contribute to cognitive decline. Uh, no question about it. And also the, the way that it does that is back to the explanation is that it reduces this uh, brain derived neurotropic factor, uh, which is the thing that you need to help you to, um, to have good sparky synapse. And that's what we all want really. And I think this is another thing that I wanted to just really mention. This is kind of in the non-negotiable um, group for me is because those high trans fatty saturated foods it's very hard to repair the um that synapse that charles was talking about once you you start to um take in those whereas with um sugar you can usually kind of burn sugars off but it's a whole different ball game with the um, the non healthy fats in your system and that those are definitely shown to um, to cause cognitive decline well so the, the that's thing one about, of the main reasons the thing about a lot of these nutrients is it's not necessarily the nutrient itself it's what it is capable of um, catalyzing, of yeah. making happen. Because um, not everything sort of, you know, otherwise we could just put sugar straight into our brains or, but I mean, there's, I mean, you cannot, you cannot reasonably argue or say that your brain and your body are separate because you know, as we were discussing earlier, if you drink caffeine, you get a hit straight away. If you drink alcohol, it doesn't take too long until, your inhibitions are lowered and actually that's um, relaxing the excitation. So that makes it easier to cross sort of various, so you might be more creative with alcohol. That's quite possible until it goes over a peak and then you start declining very rapidly and have no sense of the reality, but it depends how much you drink, of course. That's the way it goes. But, but that, I think that's a very simple example of how um, what you ingest will affect your brain there's no question about it i think but what your body does fantastically is that it will take what it needs it will process what it needs sometimes it synthesizes what it needs in combination with other sort of organs and everything else and will then sort of engender um, other hormones peptides other sort of um, chemicals that will affect how your your mood your emotions and certainly um, all your cognitive uh, abilities. So the next one that I think we're gonna talk about is of course, omega-3, which I reckon is probably, in food terms, is the magic bullet, really. Mm. So you get it from salmon, trout, sardines, any good oily fish. Um, 
and what it affects more than anything else, uh, partly because of its um, ability to uh, influence the, the amygdala, the uh, hippocampus and the hypothalamus, is your, um, your memory and your learning. And loads and loads and loads of studies out there about um, omega-3 and its, um, its ability to uh, connect with or to, to engender the DHA, which then engenders the plasticity of the brain. So uh, without, well, no, it's not scientific to say, but I'm gonna say it anyway, is that of course, if you wanna think uh, differently, creatively, or more expansively, or on different routes and different connections, then obviously you should be eating good, healthy, omega-3 fat foods. That's yeah. the thing. And, and the other thing with that is if you are not a fish person, flax and flax oil are amazing to integrate. And the other thing that I was just going to touch on with um, fish, especially these days, <coughs> is we want to do, we want to um, always have wild caught. Um, and that's, yep. that, that's ideal as well. So especially if you're going to be boosting your brain power and adding these foods in a couple times a week. Um, you definitely want to look for the wild caught and not the farm raised. So I think that's an important distinction as well. If we're going to be upping our fish or flax um, oil. So there you go. And I think the key in all of this is really, um, it's quite a buzzword at the moment, is brain plasticity, which is its ability not just to be flexible, but to, to find different routes to make different connections and for me, that's one of the definitions of creativity, to yes. be quite honest, is finding different ways to think about old problems. Um, antioxidants is the next sort of big one. So in this, we have coffee. Well, that's caffeine, obviously. Um, and then something called curcumin, which is basically turmeric. Uh, turmeric hits two fantastic categories. And again, extremely trendy at the moment. Very, very popular. Um, for all sorts of reasons, not so many of them proven, but it is proven to be a good antioxidant. And part of the reason that you need uh, antioxidants is that the brain apparently is very susceptible to oxidative damage. Now, I don't know, frankly, exactly what oxidative damage is, but I assume that it is, um, it's a type of impairment that then sort of slows down the amount, the speed at which, or the fluidity with which you can actually think. But I'm not absolutely sure exactly what uh, oxidative damage is, but I do know that um, the, the other things that have got their antioxidant, which are also very popular, particularly blueberries, for instance, and berries, uh, but particularly blueberries, spinach, broccoli, Liver, heart and kidney, which not so many people eat anymore, I think. I don't know. They used to eat it more. Um, and this all helps to, um, to regulate homeostasis, and which, as I keep coming back to, is one of the incredibly important um, factors in how we actually exist in many ways, mentally, physically, all sorts of different ways, Just in, in terms of society as well. There's, um, I'm just reading a book at the moment which is all about this uh, metaphor between um, democratic society and how the brain works, which is fascinating because the similarities uh, are enormous. And it is a very good, a much better metaphor, I think, than uh, a computing brain because we're not linear. We're not computing sort of straight down the line. Um, we might be computing in sort of a zero one basis or a binary basis but um, but I think that the metaphor of this sort of huge sort of network that is uh, an emergent system which is almost uncontrollable within certain structures and parameters so that pretty much sounds like government over here at the moment very uncontrollable anyway next thing is flavonoids <laughs> so this is it chocolate you can have chocolate, definitely, uh, but dark chocolate, apparently. Apparently, I, I'm not quite sure exactly what the active ingredient is in that, but it's certainly the flavonoids, obviously. And why that gets diluted with milk chocolate, I don't know. 
Um, maybe it's the sugar that counteracts it, because sometimes things work for and against certain things. Um, and there are certainly, in fact, if I can just find it somewhere, there are certain sort of peptides that are created that um, some of them uh, increase metabolic rates and some of them decrease metabolic rates. And they're both working sort of always in slight tension with each other, it would appear, as do many things. So, cocoa beans ginkgo bilboa tree but we don't know which part of the tree it is it might be the tea it might be the leaves we don't know um dark chocolate of course and uh, flavonoids are quite easily apparently um, go past the blood brain barrier they do affect happiness without any doubt uh, and we know this because uh, one of our favorite chocolate manufacturers did do a huge study to prove that um, chocolate does uh, have an effect on your mood and makes you happier and that was Nestle and they did a massive study to prove that I'm not sure how scientific the proof was but they proved it and it's published all over the world and everybody now wants chocolate of course but the other thing is of course that it um, it is very good or for all flavonoids very good for cognitive enhancement and very good for memory and for learning. A lot of these things keep coming back to memory and learning, and that's because uh, a lot of the the um, the things that they catalyze are the uh, hippocampus, the hypothalamus, and the amygdala, which are all very much related to the reward system, the memory system, and the learning system. And an interesting side fact, nothing to do with nutrition, is that of course learning new things engenders much healthier synaptic activity so uh, and i think about a year ago there was a big study on this um, that learning a new language in older age is extremely good for you better than sudoku so forget the sudoku i hate it <laughs> it annoys me <laughs> um right so then um folate and folic acid i think mostly more for women particularly pregnant women I think is that right Christina yeah, yeah so, follow so and you find it in spinach orange juice yeast um, and um, it it leads to uh, a lowering of depression apparently uh, allegedly uh, according to the studies and again prevents long-term cognitive decline so I'm not sure what the effect is on uh, women but or pregnant women for that matter but maybe do you know Christina? I think it's a it's just a development. Apparently, there's more folate or folic acid needed in right. during pregnancy. Um, vitamin E, very uh, also vitamin D is very important, but I'm not going to talk about vitamin D. But I'm going to talk about vitamin E a bit. Nuts, vegetable oils, uh, green veg, and these again reduce cognitive decay and have been shown to be beneficial in the very early stages of Alzheimer's and other sort of cognitive decline. Um, it, it, it's not a cure at all, but it does help to some extent. So they think, well, I think, again, very, very difficult to get uh, proper clinical studies on these sorts of things. But um, nuts are full of not just vitamin E, but also protein and all sorts of other wonderful things that are very good for your body. Um, the other thing I think we might need to talk about is again, come back to calorie restriction, because there's been quite a lot about uh, the, um, I can't remember what it's called, where you, you, you eat a restricted calorie diet for one day, and then you can eat whatever you want the next day. But um, apparently, not apparently, the scientific evidence that has been done, or the scientific studies that have been done, show that calorie restriction does increase um, your cognitive ability. Um, it, it's not a question of it clearing anything out or um, detoxing, which is another word I hate because your body detoxes anyway. It does it quite normally, quite naturally. You don't need to get rid of it all. Um, but calorie restriction um, has been shown and proven to, um, to increase cognitive ability considerably. So this is what I think a lot of uh, people are worried about at the moment, is that where we are over-consuming, particularly in the West, uh, and way over-consuming, 
that we are um, gradually sort of lowering our cognitive ability and the development of our brains. Now, brain development obviously happens very, 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 very slowly over thousands of years. You would have thought so, wouldn't you? But it doesn't. Actually, um, it's much shorter than that. And fantastic study done in a, Swedish, a remote Swedish village um, about um, does your lifestyle pass on to various generations? And they studied this Swedish village. I, I don't know exactly who did it, but I do have the study. Um, and um, they studied it for nearly 100 years. So that's pretty good data. What they found was that um, cognitive, I don't know exactly how they measured it, what I'm trying to say, but cognitive impairment was uh, found to happen in times of plenty and it was passed on through generations until there were times of scarcity. So it went from um, grandparent to grandchild. Um, so they would have a reduced cognitive ability or um, uh, plasticity of the brain um, over a long period of time which um, which I think is quite amazing really to find that there is that you can prove that kind of thing um, what all these things sort of do and particularly with the um, the Swedish study and all the rest is what they found now is that there is another thing a bit like dark matter I believe well it probably isn't dark matter somebody knows what it is but nobody knows what dark matter is called a silent information regulator which um, fascinates me and I have to dig into this find out a lot more about it um, it's part of a 13 protein family and apparently moderates genetic stability now um, what sort of strikes me as sort of there's this epigenetic thing with things that, are, that influence the genes but don't change the genes, as far as, far as I understand. And this, this substance, this protein, um, regulates or moderates genetic stability and cellular homeostasis. homeostasis. Um, and fat reduces the amount of cert you have in your brain. So there's another good reason not to eat too much um, fatty, uh, trans fatty saturated foods. And the nice thing, of course, is that here comes our hero again is omega-3 to the rescue. Omega-3 does increase the amount of service that you have. I, I, think, I think there must be a limit, as with all things, there is a limit, um, a sort of homeostatic level that you get to where um, your brain says, okay, that's it, I've had enough, that's it, I don't need any more. A bit like vitamin C, that no matter how much you consume, you just expel what you don't need. So yeah, so basically, I hope that sort of um, proves a little bit that, um, that what you ingest, the feeding that you do, affects your reward systems, first of all, it affects your emotions, and then it affects your cognition. So it is, um, there's, there's definitely a link uh, and it's not just a link because I think you cannot separate the two. They're not, um, you can't have a brain in a jar. It wouldn't work because there's no information or nutrients coming in. Or I suppose you can pump in the nutrients, but um, you might be able to keep the brain alive, but I don't think it would be thinking because it doesn't have anything to think about really. If you haven't got a body, you can't think about anything. Uh, that sounds strange, but I think that's true. And I'm not even sure that you can think conceptually if you don't have a body, because everything is based around the information that you ingest, not just nutrients, but um, any kind of sensory information that then gets sort of, um, that is then perceived in a certain way with a certain view and a certain angle. And then sort of, gradually sort of forms the way that you behave. And that's one of my sort of key sort of things is that um, how you think is how you behave and how you behave is how you think. And the two sort of run after each other all the time. The same with belief. And um, so that's why if you, if you ingest the right things, if you, if you read books, if you uh, feed yourself culturally, if you feed yourself uh, nutritionally, if you do all these things, it's got to come out better, hasn't it?
I think it does. <laughs> anyway, we have put together, haven't we, Christine? I think you're going to do this bit. Um, we've put together sort of six fundamental, and they're so obvious, it's, it must be right, because it's Occam's razor, isn't it? If it's that obvious, it must be true. Um, six pillars of brain health. Go for it. So, so uh, since we just discussed all the studies backing everything that we talked about with um, the, the body and the brain, the six pillars of brain health, so physical exercise, talked about that being the magic bullet, and it doesn't have to be a lot of physical exercise. It can be a 30-minute walk. It can be uh, just a little bit of exercise or movement throughout the day. Food and nutrition, so anything that you put in your body, obviously is either going to build it or break it down. <laughs> so we wanna think about what you put in the body. And like Charles was saying, your body has a, a, an enormous ability to reach homeostasis, um, but we can definitely fuel our mind better with this knowledge that we've just given you. Medical health, so obviously how you are um, physically, and sleep and relaxation, this is a huge yeah. thing I think that is not emphasized enough, is how we rest, restore, and um, reboot. I think this is huge in everything. I'm going to put one small bit into uh, sleep and relaxation. I'm a big fan, uh, my wife isn't, but I'm a big fan of do nothing. Just yes. find the time to do nothing. And sit and do nothing. I mean... I think it's very, very, very good for you to daydream, to just sort of let your mind sort of run anywhere it wants to go. I think that that's also a very, very important part of sort of um, becoming sort of healthier cognitively and physically as well. It's just do nothing. We hate it nowadays, particularly in the West. We think, uh, you know, lunch is only for wimps. And uh, well, no, it isn't. No, what you need. And I hope now, well, I don't know, but I think now that um, with COVID-19 and everything else, that um, we will perhaps begin to change our lifestyles, certainly for a while. I think as with homeostasis, it will come back to the same sort of thing that we had before eventually, but, but not exactly the same, I think. Sorry, carry on, sleep and relaxation, and then? I think, well, I'm just gonna say one more thing. I think that <laughs> what you were just talking about is huge too. We have, you know, with the space created, um, with the situation, we've created space and that's what we need to bring in new ideas. We need that mm. space, getting rid of technology, going yeah. for a walk, just that space, that openness, that time to think creatively, I think is enormous and it's not um, em emphasized enough. Mental fitness, I think this is also along the same lines. It's kind of we, what we've been talking about with flow and peak performance. <laughs> um, and our, our, I don't want to say oh, resilience, but I do want to say that mm -hmm. our tools, like our toolkit in order to have positive stressors, to deal with negative stressors, and the tools that we have in our, our, our mental fitness. I'll tell you a really interesting thing is that uh, what they found recently with a lot of the neuroscience that's going on and, and the talk about plasticity is that... Um, that you are never limited by age in what you can learn. You only think you can't. Now, there is some, some physical cognitive decline, that's true. But um, what recent studies have shown, particularly on this subject of plasticity, is that if you learn new things, even in old age, it will keep you much younger, much healthier, and then gives, increases your ability to learn, to memorize, and everything else. So, yeah. And then the last one is what we're all missing at the moment. Yeah, so social interaction. I think this is an interesting one too. And this had to do a lot with um, the blue zones that I mentioned earlier and those communities that lived near, usually near water, near the ocean. But they had for when they ate and they had, they had a lot of family interaction and they also had social interaction. Um, and the one thing that they also, as the... Um, as people got older, there was still an integral part of the um, part of the community they were contributing to, and I think so, mm. social interaction is huge for brain health um, and just our ability to talk to each other about different ideas. I feel like that's huge. Um, Chris, do you want to explain about your diet diary? Yes. So we're rolling into the end. Okay, so. 
since we've gone over all this stuff, I, we really wanted to talk about a little bit about um, for you to be able to assess what you are eating and how it's doing for your health. So very basically, without getting into too much, um, we're going to be we're going to give you a food log, which is basically a way to record your food, your the time you eat, the energy you feel, or the mood you have afterwards, um, and then your digestive system. So if food, food is usually not good for you, if you feel any digestive discomfort, if you feel super tired afterward, it actually should be a little bit energizing. Um, you are going into digestive you are going to be digesting, but you don't want to be too tired. Um, mm. So things to think about energy, digestive system, um, mood, and yeah, all of that. So you're going to want to record that in the food log. And if you see anything like, um, I know, I didn't know for a long time that gluten, you know, certain kinds of gluten weren't really good for me, but I'd fall asleep within 10 minutes. And I, that's a, pretty good sign that that I might be sensitive to that. That sounds so, like me every evening. Yeah. <laughs> so that's just an idea. And and what I want you to do is think about the foods you're currently eating, write those down, see how you feel, and then add in some of the cognitive enhancing foods that we described, whether it's the dark chocolate, usually you want to get over 75% um, without the milk chocolate, um, with blueberries, raspberries, um, your omegas, so you're going to do your fish, possibly the flax, um, spinach, dark leafy greens. So adding in some of the positive brain foods and seeing how those might in, you know, increase your focus or reducing some of the foods that might be causing you a little bit more um, brain fog and then adding in more of the foods that we could obviously increase performance. Um, the other, the other interesting thing, Christina, with this, I think, is the time lag between food and then i mean i know for myself it, and i haven't quite worked out which foods it is if i eat certain foods um in the evening for an evening meal then some of those foods um definitely sort of weigh heavily on me if i go for a run in the morning sometimes they don't at all and i need to i mean that's really i'm going to do the diary as well because um, i'm very curious to find out what it is I eat that sort of says, yes, I can run sort of eight kilometers today or no, I can only do two and I've had enough. So, so the time is quite difficult. It's so interesting. And so some foods are going to, um, this is a whole nother subject um, for inflammation um, because right now mm. we're just talking about cognitive enhancement. But foods that could cause you inflammation, there's certain things that you could look for in your food log. And I'll just describe that just because Charles mentioned that really quickly. Um, if, if you eat foods, um, especially in the evening, and you can't really get to sleep, they might be causing inflammation. And then if you eat foods in the evening and you actually gain weight from the evening time to the next morning, because that's usually inflammatory weight you always want to um, weigh yourself in the morning in the morning. However, if you do gain weight from the evening to the morning, that's usually um, a sign that foods could not be that um, optimal for your body. And everybody's different, of course. And everybody's completely different. So, you know, Charles and I are probably eating completely different things. <laughs> um, and and sure. some foods are gonna be good for me and some foods are gonna be good for him, but not good for both of us. No, um, no berries for me. So no, yeah, and it's really interesting. Um, uh, there's a lot of um, information out there about different things. So, um, so basically, in a nutshell, for your food log, I want you to log how you feel afterwards, how you possibly, like you were saying, how you feel in the morning. See if you can kind of decipher if you are eating any trans fats, maybe trying to get some of those out, um, and then adding in coconut and, and olive oil, which are, are, are shown to be better for your mind and your body at this point, and um, adding in some of the cognitive foods that we talked about. Yeah. So that's and I will, very I will um, with the replay, I will um, send out uh, a link to your diary yes. and to the, um, the little chart we have of the, the sort of the key nutrients the key. and where you can find them sort of quite simply in what kinds of foods. Because yes. uh, it's very easy to forget and then think, oh, right, I'm definitely going for a deep fried Mars bar now. <laughs> Delicious, I'm sure. 
Okay, I don't know if anybody has got any questions. If you have, please type them in. Um, I'll tell you what we're going to do next week, shall I? Yeah, and oh, I was just going to say one more thing. So yep. this is, oh, awesome. Anne was talking about something, um, but we'll mention that in just a second. I just okay. did just want to mention that I do, um, this is one of my specialties. If you do want personal information, I can definitely do some um, little coaching with you around this, but we are going to do a follow-up to this as well at some point yep. in the next couple of weeks. So now, Charles, what are we doing right, next? Right, so next week we're going to get joined, or we will be joined by a friend of mine, Liam, who runs a website, uh, um, not just any old website, he runs a mind mapping website. Um, and it's called, it's called, not boiling plate. Now, why do I always say boiling plate, not boiler plate? It's um, called bigger plate. Bigger plate. Yeah, <laughs> bigger plate. But it's stuck in my mind as boiler plate. But anyway, it's called um, biggerplate.com. Yeah, bigger and he's a real specialist in, um, particularly in computer generated mind mapping techniques and what they are. So um, between he, I, and Christina, we're going to sort of have a look at mind mapping, only because I think mind mapping is a much better way to record anything, to do anything, to analyse anything, and to enjoy doing it, to have fun with it. So I don't know, have we got any questions, Christina? No, I think we're good. I mean, Anna okay. was just talking about she knows a lot about oxidative stress and antioxidants. We might bring her in on the um, follow up to this one. Oh, yeah. Um, that yeah. would be great. We'll get her involved. And, and um, so after the mind mapping one, which I feel like is going to be great. So we're kind of intertwining the, all this cognitive um, enhancement and getting you guys to think creatively, fill your mind and your body so you can think um, creatively as well. Mind mapping. I thought it was cool when Liam described you can either deconstruct or construct with mind mapping, yeah. which I thought was awesome. Yeah. So um, that's going to be gonna a fun one. A live sort of a live demonstration just to show how easy it is to do yeah. a mind map. Um, I don't personally, I don't use computer mind maps at all. I've tried lots and lots and lots of times, uh, but I just love getting a pen in my hand and a piece yeah. of paper and mucking around and seeing yeah. where it goes. So anyway, so that's it. Um, and uh, see you all hopefully next week. Um, and do keep your, I don't know, do you want people to return the, um, the um, diaries? The so why diaries? don't we... So we'll do mind mapping next week. Hold on to the food log and then we'll do the follow up the week after. Um, okay. And we'll talk about a little bit about the food log and I might dive into a little bit with, um, um, we'll talk about inflammation possibly. Because it'd be really interesting. I mean, you can, I suppose you can send them back anonymously once you, but you need at least a week. No, I think, um, um, I think with a food log, if you want, if you want some feedback or you have any, Thing that you personally want to ask me questions with, please feel free to email me at Christina at Swell Fit Living. Charles will put it on there. And then if you do want any personal advice, I can definitely do some coaching. But we will hopefully, we'll follow up with people in the next couple of weeks. So just kind of hang yeah. on to the food log and see what you personally find out about yourself. But it would be quite interesting, wouldn't it, if, if you want to send them back anonymously as well, and then we can sort of see whether we can collate some of the results to um to see whether there's anything significant and whether you're all eating way too much trans fatty stuff which you should you're it's like your own little study <laughs> well, that'd be interesting wouldn't it i know that it would be. be that'd be great yeah, great okay all right, well, everybody. thank you so much everybody